Good morning, Mesa Church and beyond. We are so excited, not just because our building is almost ready, but we believe God has a special word for you this morning. A couple weeks ago, Tara and I and our family, we went on vacation. We went to Springfield, Missouri, and uh, there's a town that is near Springfield called Branson. Maybe you've heard of Branson. They've got a lot of performances and shows that happen, but they also have this um, place. There's a lot of family type friendly fun and this place called the Butterfly Palace. And uh, Tara's aunt um, hosted us at the Butterfly Palace. I'm not sure it necessarily would have been a place that we would have chosen to go, but turns out it was a really fascinating and, and neat experience. And you learn all about butterflies and then you get to walk into this room where the butterflies are like flying all around you. And it's just, that's a really interesting experience, having thousands of butterflies flying all around you. They land on you. They land on these little um, dealy mabobbers that have some sweet stuff in it. And they land on there and you can look at them and they land on your hat. It's just kind of a cool experience. But one of the cool things that I learned uh, in that experience was we watched a film about the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly is uh, really a fascinating butterfly. Um, many of us are, we recognize the monarch butterfly because it's, it's got that uh, very distinct color pattern of orange and black. But I learned that they go through a very long migration from Texas all the way past, um, all the way north up even into Canada. And then they come all the way back down to a place in Mexico. And it takes three generations of monarch butterflies um, to go through their life cycle so that the next generation can, you know, complete this rhythm, this this three generation pattern of life. And one of the interesting things about not just monarch butterflies, but our, all butterflies is they don't start out as a butterfly. Of course, you know, they start out as a caterpillar. Uh, cater how do you see that? Caterpillar. And uh, a caterpillar goes into um, uh, a transformation season or phase and it emerges out of that um, out of that uh, cocoon as a butterfly and it flaps those wings and it you know continues that journey and butterflies have actually have long been connected to the life of Christians because Christians aren't born Christians they are born caterpillars and they turn into something through a process of transformation that God takes them through and you know one of the misconceptions I believe in the world today about Christianity um, is that change is not necessary for uh, for us to follow God. And it's an interesting, it's kind of a, it's, it, it, it's, I think it's good natured in the sense that a lot of times people believe that God created us just exactly how we're supposed to be. And I think maybe that comes from Psalm 139 where, you know, the psalmist says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, but it doesn't take into account really the journey towards Christ that God desires for all of us. And while God has created us fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's wombs, we aren't exactly that perfect expression of Jesus, um, you know, at any point in our lives. And it's this lifelong journey of becoming more like Jesus that reflects God's desire and ultimate purpose for us. So we're, today we're going to look at um, the second part of the book of Ephesians. And of course, we know that the first part is about what God has done for us. And before we can do anything for God, we really need to know and understand what he's done for us. And today, which is where our passage is found, um, it, it is really understanding what we can do for God. But we can't understand what we can do for God until we understand what God has already done for us, what God has done for us in um, our life previous to Jesus. And so I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter four, as we think about that question, why is change necessary? You know, why can't we just be caterpillars for the rest of our lives and, and just, you know, crawl around plants and eat? I mean, what what is the more that God has for us as individuals, but also for us as individuals living in community, which is what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, a unified community, a healthy community, a community of transformation and change. But why is that change necessary? Let's go ahead and pick it up in chapter four, verse 17. Uh, it says this, with the Lord's authority, this is Paul speaking, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Before we dive into this passage, let's just pray and ask the Lord to 
just speak to our hearts and give us a spirit of humility to learn from what he desires for us today. Father, I pray that you would, first and foremost, before we ever try to connect uh, or correct anything in culture, I just pray that you would help us to see uh, what is inside of us and help us to see where, where we fall short of the high standard of Jesus in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the desire to become everything that you've called us to be. Um, and, and, and not excusing any of our behaviors that don't reflect you, but putting off our old self and putting on our new self with the power and help of the Holy Spirit. Help us to become all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The reality of Christianity is that it is a faith of change. It is and would be unwise for us to adhere to this idea that we are perfectly made from the moment that God conceives us in our mother's wombs. He has fearfully and wonderfully made us, but he's called us to change. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's speaking with authority and he's saying, stop living like you used to live or like the world lives. Eugene Peterson, who uh, translated the Bible into um, his own way of speaking, um, translates it in a way that I've found pretty refreshing. He says this, and so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there may be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. And feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession, addicted to every sort of perversion. And of course, Eugene Peterson is referencing this historical statement that Paul is speaking and he's calling us to change but is this something that it was just for Paul's day or is it something that we can apply to our lives too um, the reality is and he's calling us to change because what happens if we don't accept the kind of change that God calls us to will end up being hopelessly confused our minds are full of darkness we've wandered from the life that God gives to closed minds hardened hearts where we are living without shame and living with lustful pleasure and eagerly anticipating and practicing every kind of impurity. And here's what Paul is saying, without God, without the kind of change that God desires for us, there is no standard of truth. And where there is no standard of truth, we just sort of descend into madness. Now, before we talk about modern culture, I just wanna talk about the culture that Paul was speaking into, because Paul was speaking into you know, the church at Ephesus, the church, these churches in, um, in Asia Minor, where he had either planted or had um, mentored the planters that had planted those churches. It was um, a Greek culture, a Roman culture, a culture that was not necessarily Jewish. It certainly, their values didn't reflect Christianity. It was, you know, and so, I mean, even as we're talking about a church that is taking ground, you got to think like the culture that Paul is speaking into, what has been normalized is what he's referencing here. And, uh, and even though there are Gentiles in the, in the church that he's speaking to, he, he's not acknowledging that they're still Gentiles. He's saying, you've got to live with this new standard that God is calling us to, this change that God is calling us to. So what was it about Greek and Roman culture that was so anathema to God or so different or so um, different than what we expect or experience today? Um, what, were, what was true about their culture in regards to premarital sex, homosexual sex, adulterous sex, holy or prostitution sex, incestuous sex? And here's what you'll discover if you look up the sexual mores and norms of um, Greek and Roman culture is that all of this was normal. It was all normal. I mean, it, it was, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like that was something that was not practiced or not talked about. It was all normal. In fact, I mean, there's just a couple of examples. A Greek boy was literally ushered into manhood at the molestation of an older Greek man. It, it was just common. It was like, that was, that was how they celebrated, you know, the change from one phase of life into the next phase of life. That's how you became a man. Um, if, if you want to know um, just how crazy it got, just look up the, the sex lives of Roman emperors. And, and I'm not necessarily advocating that you do that because it's crazy. It's worse than the worst soap opera that you can watch today. Um, there was all sorts of craziness that happened in the leaders' lives. And of course, that sort of acceptance of that would trickle down into society. And 
the reality is Paul is referencing what was normal in the context, the cultural context of the church that he's speaking into. Now, remember, he's not speaking to the world. He's not judging the world. He's not, um, he's not setting the standard, but he is speaking to the church living in that standard. And he's saying, you can't live like that anymore. God's called you to change. He's called you into something greater, into something better. I think when we read a passage like this, um, we, we need to compare it to our culture. So let me just read a couple quotes from some famous people. And I'm not trying to put people in our culture, you know, in a bad place. That's why I'm not going to tell you who these quotes come by. Uh, but I'm sure if you looked it up, you could figure it out. One celebrity said this, there is nothing wrong with going to bed with someone of your own sex. People should be very free with sex, but they should draw the line at goats. <laughs> I mean, isn't that a crazy, crazy thing? And the reality is, I mean, who knows where the line will be in five years or in 10 years or in 30 years, you know, as these things become normal. Maybe if we look at where Greek culture and Roman culture ended up, we'll discover where we're headed. I found another celebrity saying this, I'm actually a pansexual. I didn't know that, she said, explaining that means that you like what you like, doesn't have to be a girl or a guy or you know, a he or a she or this or that. Literally, you like personality, like you just like being a being. Another celebrity said, the whole issue of sexuality is so gray, I'm just trying to acknowledge that fluidity, that grayness, which has always existed, but maybe only now are we allowed to start talking about it. The truth is, this has always been in the reality of humanity. People have always drawn the line somewhere. Um, in fact, I love that quote by G.K. Chesterton said, who said this, art like morality consists of needing to draw the line somewhere. Uh, everyone draws the line somewhere, but God calls us to the lines that he's drawn and he's called us to, if our lines don't line up with his lines, to change our lines, to reflect what his lines are. And it would be easy for us as Christians to judge the world, but God hasn't called us to do that. God has called us to ourselves, live out the change that he's calling us to to live out. This is truth for the church, okay? And we need to ask ourselves, is this true of me? Do I have um, any sense of connection to what Paul is saying? Do I still live like that? Uh, are there areas of my life that still, um, that still don't reflect that high standard of change that God is calling me to? Um, and the only way that we'll be able to know that is if we adopt a standard that isn't based on my, defini my definition, but it's based on God's definition. It has to be the standard that he gives to us because otherwise, you know, what this person says is right is wrong and what this person says is wrong is right. And you know, one of the celebrities says, oh, it's okay here, but you know, we draw the line here. Well, where are we drawing the line? I mean, it really is hard to discern where that line is supposed to be. But we know for sure that God does draw a line and he's calling us to change where our line is to reflect his line. God is calling us to change so that we don't end up living the confused lives that we once lived, that we recognize everywhere because everyone has different lines and different definitions. And have you ever found yourself just being confused? I don't even know what people expect of me. I don't even know what to say because it's just confusing. That's really, that's the world that we're living in right now. Um, I wouldn't even <laughs> think that you'd have to think too hard about Roman culture or Greek culture. That is where we are right now. Can you imagine how culturally relevant this statement is? So how do we do that? Where is that line? What does the standard look like? This is what Paul says, verse 20, but that is not what you learned about Christ. 21, since you have already heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So God is calling us to live out this change that he has, um, that he has um, spoken over our lives and created us for. And that call is very simply to learn to live like Jesus. That's, that's the church's mission. That's the church's purpose. That's the church's desire. If you have chosen Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, it's, it's not where I draw the line anymore. It's not where I define reality to be. Um, in fact, every area of my life is now submitted to the Lord. 
That's what being saved from sins means and submitting to the Lordship of Jesus. It's learning to live like Jesus. And Paul's reminding us of this new standard that it's not a definition that someone else has created. My definition of truth is literally the life Jesus lived and the life Jesus is calling me to live. Um, and so where do we find our information about Jesus? And this is part of the reason why we believe in the authority of scripture. It has to come from somewhere. It can't just come from my neighbor who tells me Jesus was like this or Jesus was like that. It comes from scripture. I, I, I've adopted the Old Testament and the New Testament because the Old Testament Jesus taught from, um, he had a Hebrew Bible, which is basically the, the Old Testament that we have today. And then of course, the story of Jesus and the story of the early church in response to the life Jesus lived. And we've got to commit to reading, memorizing, and understanding how Jesus fits into all of scripture. This is God's call in our life. We'll never know where that standard is if we don't study, memorize, and, um, and understand how the Old Testament leads up to Jesus and how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the cultural context and the theology that runs through. It's a lifetime commitment. And there's a lot of information. We've talked about this too, but information is not enough. Information must lead to transformation. And transformation is a partnership between us and God. And I want, to, I want to show you the secret sauce of what transformation is in the New Testament. Because otherwise, this just becomes a self-help journey of failure and, and, um, and struggle. Because we'll set the goals and we won't get there. But God wants you to live like Jesus. So what does transformation to live like Jesus looks like? Verse 22, it's throwing off the old nature. And then verse 24, it's putting on the new nature, which is holiness, righteousness. Holiness just means to be set apart for God, right? We're set apart to be God's sons and daughters, to live like his name is, is on us, like we are really God's kids. But it's very easy to miss the most important path, uh, verse in this, in this passage, and that is verse 23. This separates us from being a Tony Robbins, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it passage, from this is what you can do, but this is how you do it. Verse 23 says, let the spirit renew our thoughts and attitudes. So we throw off the old nature and we put on the new nature, but we also must give God permission to renew our thoughts and our attitudes. I love visual illustrations. You know this about me. So I, I brought um, a jersey and you know, once upon a time I had a favorite, <laughs> I had a favorite player on the Seahawks team, and of course, he is no longer playing for the Seahawks, but I still have his jersey, and it's still a Seahawks jersey, mind you. And uh, the truth is, this is what it looks like to become a Christian. You put on this jersey, right? But we all know that putting on a jersey doesn't make you a true fan. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Like, I can take this shirt off, I can put this jersey on, and I'm not necessarily a true fan. What makes me a true fan is when my heart is uh, is overwhelmed by this love for the Seahawks. And I, and I wanna celebrate when the Seahawks win, and I wanna mourn when the Seahawks lose, right? I mean, it's going to a Seahawks game with the jersey on, and when they score a touchdown, it's, it's getting excited. And, and, and when, when, a, when a great player is traded away, it's like, oh, I gotta work through this. How do I, it's conflicted feelings. And you know what I've noticed about Christianity? There's a lot of people who put the jersey on, right? Because they love the pastor or maybe because of someone that they really love or a celebrity even like, you know, they got baptized in the Jordan River or something and they came back and they're like, oh my goodness, this person is a Christian. That means I can be a Christian. So they throw the jersey on, but their heart really was never transformed. And then, you know, the person goes off and does this or they lose their respect. And this is what I, I need you to hear. This is so important because sometimes our transformation journeys are stunted because the people that we love get traded or they move or they move on or whatever. And you need to understand that the only person on this jersey is Jesus. It has to be Jesus. It has to be based on Jesus. And learning to live out the Christian life is learning to live up to the standard of Jesus. It has to be so clear. And if you find yourself struggling when some of these people that you love or, or whatever, you just need to let the Holy Spirit take you a little deeper. I mean, it really, they're like tests. It shows you how deep is my love for what God is doing through me and for Christ. And the key is to not only just put that jersey on, but of course it is to let the Holy Spirit change our hearts. 
That happens through prayer, it happens through relationship, it happens through mentorship, um, but there are certainly some pitfalls out there. I don't want you to put the jersey on without letting God transform your heart because that is the difference between self-help and spirit-led transformation. It is a partnership between you and the Holy Spirit. It's not just putting the jersey on, but it's putting the jersey on and letting God create something new in you. So this is what it looks like. It looks like a changed life learning to live like Jesus. And that change requires us to not just believe in information about Jesus, which we find in scripture and great sermons and YouTube and all that, but actually learning to live like Jesus. That's transformation. That's not just information, that's transformation. And so we partner with the Holy Spirit to put on our new nature. Then Paul gets real practical, right? Because he's talking about us living in community. He's talking about the church in contrast to the world that this church is living in. Just, I mean, imagine the church in Ephesus. You know, they're, 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 they've got all of these crazy sexual norms and practices and all of these business ethical things that are happening in the church is growing and becoming what God has called it to be, even in the midst. They're taking ground in the midst of all of this. And so then he gets really practical with a couple areas. And this is what he says. Again, this is Paul talking about Christian community and what it looks like practically to put on the new nature, to to be that Holy Spirit-led transformation and to to put this new nature on. So he says this in verse 25. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all parts of the same body. Next issue. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil third issue if you're a thief quit stealing i mean listen to how practical paul is being instead use your hands for good work um, and then give generously to others in need four don't use foul or abusive language let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be encouraged to those who hear them five and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he's identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words. So he's summarizing here, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. When we learn to live out this gospel change, this God-focused change in our lives, patterning our lives after Jesus, right? We're not judging the world, but we are allowing God to purify our hearts, to become, allow us to become holy and righteous in our thoughts, in our motivations, in how we treat each other. It has to be reflected in, in the everyday, in the nitty gritty of life. That's what I love about this. Paul gets really down to the nitty gritty. So verse 25, he just says, stop lying. Because when you live like Jesus in community, um, it's life-giving and life-giving communities will um, in turn attract people to the life that's created there. And so lying doesn't contribute to a life-giving community. The truth is really good in community. Two, he says, control your anger. Why? Because when you control your anger, it's good in community. No one wants to be a part of a community where some guy is just, or gal, is just constantly losing their temper and and throwing tantrums. It's like, no, I don't want to be a part of that, right? No one wants to be a part of a community of spiritual toddlers. Could you imagine how horrible that would be? I mean, we um, secretly inside complain and cry when a toddler is crying on a plane, right? We also give compassion because we know we've all been there. I've been there. I know what it's like. but it's still, it's tough. So control your anger. Uh, Three, verse 28, stop stealing, right? Instead, work hard and give generously. Why? Because this is good in community. It, 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 it's life-giving. I mean, when, when you are coming from a deficit and you come into a community and there is margin in that community and you can be blessed by that community and, and it actually meets needs in your life, Oh my goodness, like that's a community that people want to be a part of. That's not confusing. It's so clear. It's it's like Jesus lived. It's beautiful. 29, stop swearing. I mean, this is one that 
um, is, is sometimes I think when, when we reference this, we have to be careful that we don't appear legalistic because sometimes we talk about things like this. It does appear that we're being legalistic, but Paul just comes out and says, this is a part of being a, in a life-giving community. Be careful what you say, how you use your words, how you speak to people because God's, um, God's called us to use our words to, to give life, to build life, to speak life over people. And uh, if you've ever had someone talk badly about you or, or even to your face, you know, call you something that is, is very hurtful, it's not a community that you wanna be a part of. You wanna run from that. You wanna get away from that. It's not life-giving. Um, and then finally in verse 30, he says, don't make God's spirit sad. And, um, and, and because God's called us to live like we're his kids. And then in verses 31 and 32, he just summarizes this, and I'll just summarize this with the word toxicity. Get rid of toxic behavior. We've all been in toxic relationships, toxic communities, toxic neighborhoods, uh, toxic relationships. And um, in, in fact, if you Google this, what do I do in a toxic relationship? I mean, they'll give you a couple steps, but ultimately the final step is run <laughs> because nobody wants to be around toxicity. And, and, and truthfully, we don't want to be toxic people. And so this is why it is so critically important that the standard of Jesus remains our standard because sometimes we have blind spots and we don't even realize we're toxic. <laughs> we could be the reason why someone is running from our community. And so we want to be a unified church, a healthy church, and a church that is comprised of individuals on the journey of change to be more and more like Jesus. Living like Jesus in community creates life-giving communities. And it's really simple. Our, our desire, our vision for our church is that we would become a life-giving church. And our culture would reflect a life-giving church. And I'm telling you, as we move into our new building, I'm really, I wanna have a beat on this. It's, it's not just the how our building makes you feel, it's how our community makes you feel. The community of people that is gonna surround you. And as God brings people into our church, we want to be a church that doesn't, um, uh, doesn't lower the standard, right? Jesus is our standard. We wanna live according to the standard of Christ. Um, and we want this to reflect in, in very real and practical ways. So what do you do if, if someone is really struggling with this stuff? Well, we've already talked about that a couple weeks ago. We're, we're patient, we're, we're forbearing, um, we're gentle. I mean, this is what creates unity in a church because there ultimately will be conflict. All of us are coming to this, this thing from different places and perspectives. But if we're going to be the life-giving community that God's called us to be, we've got to just not just wear a jersey, but we've got to let actually God transform our hearts. And it has to happen um, in our hearts. And so this isn't legalism and this isn't just a bunch of rules but this is us learning to live what Jesus has already done for us. And that's what I love about this passage and that's what I love about Paul referencing Jesus in here because Jesus isn't asking us to do something that he hasn't already done for us, right? He asks us to forgive people just like he's forgiven us. So this isn't like we're not following a God that is expecting us to treat people better than he's treated us. He's just asking us to love as he's loved us. And friends, I mean, his love is unconditional, it's sacrificial, it's deep. It's the kind of community that if, if we can commit ourselves to doing that better and better and better, I mean, this will be a beautiful life-giving community. And this is, this is not something that happens in a year. I mean, it's just something that we have to remain committed to and week after week, we have to raise up that standard of Christ and, and, and measure ourselves up to it and, and up to where we were, which is why Paul says, this is how you used to live. This is not condemning the world. This is, we're coming out of something and we wanna reflect this new thing that God is doing. In a way, I think about the monarch butterfly and um, I'm amazed that each butterfly goes through that transformation and they finish the segment that they are called to finish. And I believe that that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of the church, that God has called each of us as individuals to be transformed by the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit working in us, putting off our old nature, putting on our new nature, so that we can be a part of a unified, healthy culture of changed lives. That's why we always say it's all about changed lives. That's the ultimate proof that God is doing something. 
So if there's something that you're struggling with, if there's an area of sin in your life, you just need to understand God loves you so much that he's not willing to let you stay there. Offer it to him. Invite the Holy Spirit into your heart, even right now, to, to change your heart, your philosophy, your thoughts on that, your attitude, because that's what God desires. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray that you would help us to become a community of people committed to transformation. Not just changing the world, but being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. Help us to, to be the change that we wanna see in this world. Help us to experience spirit-led change that results in Christ-like behavior. Not rules without relationship, but because of our relationship with you, the way we live is being transformed. We commit our hearts to you, our lives to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I wanna say bye to you, but there's one way that you can um, just commit yourself to this journey and take a step. Maybe you'll uh, consider and pray about joining the Mesa launch team um, that's happening in the month of August. Part of that is just committing ourselves to prayer and just saying, God, what is it that you're doing in our church? What do you wanna do in me? At the end of the day, we've got to surrender our lives to him in order for him to transform us. I hope that you'll take that step today. Click that link, join the Mesa launch team because God is gonna relaunch our church, Mesa Church, coming September and we wanna be unified, healthy, and changing towards Jesus. God bless you.